I have the honor and uh, pleasure to present to you our next In Conversation. Crowned as the ninth most beautiful woman of the millennium, her debut movie is in Tamil cinemas. Wow. She's an Indian Canadian actress, model, TV host, philanthropist, and a social activist. She debuts as a writer with her memoir, Close to the Bone. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really, hey, good afternoon. <laughs> Varnikam. <laughs> I am really, really, truly extraordinarily thrilled to be here at the Radiant Wellness Conclave because, you know, those two words are, first of all, very interesting to me. Renuka, we didn't get a chance. We've been chatting and we've been chatting about my book and emotional wellness and <clears throat> all sorts of wellness, but radiant and wellness. To put those two words together, I think, you know, creates a very strong and profound mantra, basically, radiant wellness. Because wellness, I think, as we all know, is an inside job. It's an inside job, but if we can radiate wellness and actually share it with others and, you know, create this sort of trip, like this uh, trickle-down effect or this ripple effect, I think that we actually have a shot at making the world better because God knows we need to make the world a little bit better. Thank you, Lisa, for having me over. <laughs> I'm sorry, Renuka. I, I, it's my habit. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I just went, plopped myself down and just started chatting because I feel like I'm sitting with an old friend. But yes, I wanted to thank you for calling me for this. <laughs> so I have to say this though. Okay. One of India's first supermodels, actor, cancer survivor, mother of twins through surrogacy, woman of no fixed address, and now an author. Liza, it's so delightful to have you. <laughs> and I'm so delighted to be here too. Thank you. Shall we start again? No, okay. We, we'll just get right into it now, Absolutely. I think. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I read your book. In fact, I read it twice. I read it once very slowly, and then yet, over the last two days, I speed read it. So, your mother, a strict disciplinarian, the blue eyed, blonde, polished lady, was a doer. And you and your father were the dreamers. So I'm just going to start taking you through your childhood. So tell us about that. Okay. I feel like I should close my eyes now and lie down as you take me through my childhood. But <laughs> um, yes, I, I <clears throat> first of all, you know, it's not so much about my book, although I'm very, very honored and gratified, you know, that, that you've read it. You know, as a, as a debut writer, I'm slightly thrilled that anyone wants to read my book. You know, it's a very sensitive thing. And to be honest, it's what I've always wanted to do with my life. My life took a very interesting detour, but I feel that I'm now aligned with my mission. But one of the reasons why <clears throat> I also wrote the book is that I do believe uh, it's not an original saying that we all have a public life, we have a private life, and we have a secret life. And I think that for a lot of my life, um, they were all running parallel to each other, but they were never meeting all these different lives that I was leading. And essentially that creates kind of a, either a conflict or a, you know, a kind of a broken space inside. And it always came back to identity as well. And identity, I think you might argue, can be connected with emotional wellness because for our emotions to stabilize and rather fluctuate sort of like the weather, as it were, not the weather in Chennai maybe, but the weather in, let's say, Canada, <laughs> where, you know, it changes from day to day. Um, in order to do that, I mean, you need to have a sense of, I think, stability, knowing of yourself and a sense of home. And for me, being of mixed blood, first of all, my father's a Bengali, my mother is Polish, as you pointed out, 
and I was born in Canada, and yet always felt very attracted to India and spent a lot of my youth in, in uh, Calcutta. Uh, it was very confusing, you know, and this was the pre-globalized era, remember. So not having a clearly defined sense of home, you know, you might argue led to this kind of a seeking nature. It fed my seeking nature and led me around the world. And the reason I'm sort of connecting that with emotions is because, again, on one hand, I think we always say, wear your heart on your sleeve, right? We have all these things, wear your heart on your sleeve. And I've certainly done that, follow your heart. And I've certainly done that. But there's also something to be said for also understanding your emotions and perhaps having a little bit of space between yourself and your emotions. Because otherwise, if we are constantly, you know, attached to these fluctuating journeys and the places that our emotions take us, that also causes, uh, I think, a lot of unhappiness and suffering in life as well. So it's an interesting, it's been an interesting journey for me and enable for me to reconcile myself, to understand myself and to share my story in a way to finally take back the power and the narrative. Because I think also what ends up happening uh, since my career began very serendipitously, even though I was born and brought up in Toronto, I obviously ended up in India at the age of 16. And believe me, it was an accident in every way. And a lot of people don't understand that. They say, well, you know, when I, when I explain to people, for instance, that um, I'm an introvert, which is, of course, why I became an actress, because that's what introverts do, right? Who try to avoid people. So you see, my life has been sort of this interesting juxtaposition, but I am an introvert by nature. And um, so when people say, well, how did you end up in this business? It's a very long story, so I thought I should write about it instead. But it, it's um, led to me being labeled a certain way. And I think that this is another tendency that we have to do. Now, labeling, I think, is very useful sometimes in certain meditative practices. You know, they say that in order to understand your emotions, to be able to control your thoughts as opposed to being controlled by your thoughts, I've been taught that you label them. You say, oh, I see that. That's anger. Oh, there's, there's jealousy coming out again, you know? So labeling has its uses, but it has its perils. And I think in today's world where we tend to box people, and not just today, but I've been labeled ever since I started. You know, I was labeled as a model. I was labeled as uh, a sex symbol when I started out. Um, I was labeled as glamorous. When actually, in reality, that had nothing to do with who I was. And so this journey to come back to myself is not, it's not just about seeking validation from the world and trying to say, listen, here's who I am, but also maybe accepting myself, all the different aspects of myself, because I have always known that I have so much more to offer. And at the same time, the world tends to, as I said, label you, box you, and decide what you're capable of, when I knew that I was capable of much more than what was expected of me. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote my book. Lisa, you were catapulted into stardom, you know, as you'd mentioned, at a very young age of 16. You came to Mumbai, and then uh, Maureen Vadia happened, and then you suddenly found yourself in the cover of Glad Rags with that lovely picture of your sunset picture. You're tired, you're all ready to wrap up, and at the last shot, you just give this striking pose, which becomes uh, the headlines, I mean, it becomes the cover of the Glad Rats. But however, when this was happening here, it was very paradoxical because uh, on the other side of the world, your mother had met with a near fatal accident. Uh, you were to be on that seat. Uh, there was that feeling of guilt that uh, there was a feeling that you could have been there. You couldn't face your mom. You had to take care of her. You had no idea what was happening in uh, the other side of the world. So it was here where India was drooling over this supermodel on the covers of Glad Rack. There, there was a 16-year-old who was down in the dumps, uh, totally different than what was being perceived. Very paradoxical, don't you think? 
extremely paradoxical um, <clears throat> on a level that I think I'm still trying to process, but uh, obviously I've done my best processing. However, you know, I mean, the, the funny thing, two things about tragedy or trauma, of course, is that number one, trauma, things like loss and grief and any sort of trauma, it doesn't actually go away, you know? We have a lot of managing mechanisms, and at 16 years old, instead of actually seeking out help, seeking out counseling, stopping, trying to process this terrible thing I did, I suddenly had this huge career in India, and what did I do, and what do we, a lot of us do, as a coping mechanism, is we distract ourselves. We stay busy. We immerse ourselves in work. And actually, that's what I mean. My career became an excuse to sidestep this trauma in my life. But the funny thing, of course, about trauma and difficult emotions is they are embedded in our body. They don't actually go away. And the more we try to ignore them, the more they embed themselves in our cells, in our, you know, in our psyche, in our organs, and in these places in our body. That's the one funny thing about trauma. The other interesting thing about trauma that I have discovered today at 47 is it can sometimes be a great accelerator. And let me explain that. It can be a great accelerator of personal growth. I certainly don't wish any of these sort of overnight kind of uh, tragedies or difficult circumstances on anyone, but let's face it, the nature of life is that difficult things will happen. And all we have within our control is how do we meet these circumstances and how do we control our reaction? So for me, becoming overnight, like an overnight sensation in India at 16, while simultaneously on the other side of the planet, myself, my mother and my father were involved in a very serious car accident, created almost a split screen existence, you know? On one hand, there we go, there's my private life. It was the lowest, darkest period of my life. And on the other hand, on the other side of the planet, there I was experiencing what we as a society define as success, right? So it's the recognition and it's the opportunities and it's the money and it's attention and all these kind of um, things that we hanker after or we're taught to hanker after. So even though it was one of the most difficult periods of my life, it actually taught me something very important very quickly. And that is that all of these things, fame, money, status, do not solve the questions of the soul and will not actually solve any of my emotional problems. And actually, at the end of it, did not make me happy at all. So it created this very interesting kind of, as I said, two narratives were going on in my life. On the surface of it, I was a celebrated model and leading this glamorous life. And then I would, you know, go home to my apartment and be alone and be very, very deeply lonely and very, very, let's say, traumatized. I was in a very dark place emotionally. I was also at the same time suffering from an eating disorder because like many young women, I was very vulnerable, I think, to the perceptions of society about what is beauty. And again, it was all because I had not found that elusive self, that grounding inside me, and that sense of self. My cues were coming from outside myself. They were external cues. You are your grades, you are your social status, you are your beauty and appearance and things like that. And we all know that that's all gonna change, that's gonna fluctuate. And that will also ultimately be taken away one day. So even though it was a very, very strong message, it was an important message at a very young age that set me on a path of trying to understand, okay, happiness is not this, therefore what is happiness? What is lasting happiness and where can I find it? Exactly, because the second paradoxical issue which I felt from, which I got from your book was exactly this, where you are perceived as this very beautiful, I won't say creature, but very beautiful human being, a very uh, pretty face, a lovely body. But then which I'd were, also like to point out, I didn't feel myself. Exactly, but you, <laughs> but inwardly you were feeling 
that you were not good enough, you had a round face, you, you were ugly, you were, uh, you know, uh, you were body shaming yourself. So again, there was a paradoxical situation there where the world perceived you as being so beautiful and aspiring to uh, be the way you were. And here you were, on the other hand, completely so different than what, so again, a very big paradoxy, you know. I mean, I think this was the biggest message in life that that's what we see and what we pursue, which is definitely not that. I think we have to tune into people in front of us sometimes because appearance doesn't necessarily um, hint at what is actually going on inside. And paradoxical is a great way of describing a lot of my life, you know. Again, these, these sort of twin uh, narratives going on. And it is true, that was another great lesson in my life and another one of the reasons why I wrote this book particularly in this age of celebrity culture that we're, that we're inhabiting right now, where somehow we feel that if you are photographed, if you're on a red carpet, if you're on the cover of a magazine, somehow your life is fixed, it's great. And somehow you are immune to a lot of the other normal pains and sorrows and ups and downs that everyone else goes through. And I think we have to understand that that is absolutely not the case. If anything, that can actually help to mask and enable a lot of other dysfunctional behavior. So, yeah, so essentially, really, the core of my story of my youth and my so-called success in the 90s, at the height of my success, I was being celebrated, and emotionally, it was the deepest, darkest, lowest period of my life, where I had no self-esteem, where I essentially had a lot of self-loathing. Um, I felt ugly. I felt unworthy. I was constantly racked by doubts. And yet, of course, I was presenting a very different face or a mask to the world. And you know, maybe because I've gone through this exercise of slowly trying to remove that mask that we all wear. Let's face it, we all wear a mask because that's how we're conditioned. I like to call it the depressive smile. You know that? How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. But you know, somewhere, I think as human beings, we can read through that. We can read each other. And you know, I think that in the pursuit of emotional wellness, of wellness of any sort, we have to allow ourselves to start removing those masks and be more vulnerable and actually connect on that deeper level, connect, you know, from human being, from one flawed, or you might say perfectly imperfect human being to another perfectly imperfect human being, instead of trying to, or falling prey to what I call the pathology of perfection. That is, I think, um, dominating our culture today and is unrealistic and is at the core of a lot of mental illness, you know, emotional wellness and a lot of dysfunction in the world today. Absolutely. Fast forward to 2009. Uh, Lisa, you um, had this feeling of extreme fatigue, tiredness, and uh, always relating that to maybe your bulimia or maybe your bad work, I mean your bad lifestyle. And then uh, the doctor does, runs a couple of tests and he sits across the table and tells you that you've got blood cancer, you've got multiple myeloma. And your reaction is, doctor, you look pale, can I give you some water? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, little, I'm a little bit of a freak, to be honest, on one level. But um, I, I, I think I'd like to, Renuka, if it's okay, maybe take a few steps back, or take, go back in time a few months before I was diagnosed that might help to put a, sort of a context, put my reaction to getting this diagnosis, being diagnosed with a basically essentially a fatal and incurable blood disease and why I reacted with a sort of smile at the doctor and you know, I saw the beads of sweat on his forehead and I looked at him and I said, Doc, you look really unwell, would you like some water? Um, the reason for that is not because I have, you know, uh, I'm super brave, I'm superhuman, um, Possibly I was a little bit in denial and shock, but essentially I would say about eight months before I was diagnosed, my mother passed. And that was obviously, you know, a very, very difficult 
period as well. There's, there's, it's very hard to put into words the passing on or the loss of a parent. And uh, I was very worried about my father because I'm an only child. So I wanted to take my father to this Buddhist retreat that I used to go to regularly, where I had personally wrestled with my mind, all the demons in my mind, and I felt that I had, I had experienced a sort of level of transformation that gave me, if not obviously enlightenment, but a sense of peace and a sense of perspective, more importantly. So I was very worried about my father's mental health and his emotional health. So I said, Dad, I'm taking you to Dharamshala. So I took him on a plane. We went. I checked him into this. It's a 10-day Buddhist retreat. Uh, they have a 10-day uh, introduction of beginners uh, uh, to Buddhism. So I checked my father into that. And I said, I will take whatever course is running simultaneously because I'm an experienced meditator. I've taken this course many times. And it just so happened to be a course on death and dying. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a very uplifting course to take. And I, <laughs> and I, you know, granted, I'm sure that perhaps voluntarily, I may not have decided to take a 10-day residential course on death and dying, but I was there to accompany my father. I had nothing else to do. I said, okay, I'll take it. Now, fortunately, I did have a background in the Tibetan Buddhist practices. The thing about these practices, and it's not that I'm endorsing necessarily any particular um, you know, spiritual practice, but what's interesting about Tibetan Buddhism in particular, that I think anyone can draw from, is their attitude towards death. And basically, which I find very, and of course we do also find this in Hinduism as well, because Tibetan Buddhism has in particular drawn a lot from uh, Hinduism, but they have refined it to a, a, you know, perhaps a greater degree. But they're one of the few traditions that really rehearses your death. Instead of just pushing it aside and treating it as something that you don't want to even put a name to, something that, yes, evokes fear that, that you don't even want to acknowledge. Here we were sitting for 10 days meditating on death and all aspects of death and what does it mean to you and sitting with the fear of it. And I'll still, I'll never remember, I'll never forget that we went through a visualization where the teacher said, okay, close your eyes, imagine you're walking into a doctor's office and he sits down in front of you and his face is very grim and he puts down a piece of paper and he says, I'm really sorry, you have six months to live. Now what ends up happening is then you begin visualizing what if, do I do if I only have six months to live? Now what am I going to do with this time? This is inevitable. I have a finite amount of time left. But what am I going to do with that time? And it was an incredible exercise to imagine yourself. Obviously, for me, it meant throwing away all of the optional stuff, cutting all of the fat out of my life, and really just focusing on what matters to me. And it was clear in a moment what I wanted to do with that time. And here's the other interesting thing. At the end of that meditation, I'll never forget, we opened our eyes and I looked around the room, and there were people from all over the world and all different shapes and sizes and backgrounds and, you know, uh, ages. And everyone had a big smile on their face. They were blissed out, which is not what you might expect when we're discussing death day in and day out. And the reason for that is because for whatever it's worth, in those moments or those minutes of visualization, you had really lived. We had taken that concept of six months and lived and done everything that makes you happy. So that was a great revelation because sometimes we do have to contemplate the finiteness of our existence in order to live fully present and be here and now and understand what is it that will enrich my life and enrich the life of those around me. So that was a very interesting serendipitous, you might say, preparation for being diagnosed with essentially a very, very serious cancer eight months down the line. 
it was incredible how, in a strange way, life had prepared me. So that might explain why I had this very strange reaction when I was actually diagnosed. It was like, oh my God, I, I've been here before, I've been prepared for this. But also something inside me said, it's okay. You're gonna get through this, it's not gonna be easy, but you will get through this. And no matter what that doctor had told me, you know, if he also had told me, you only have about two, three months to live, I knew that I was not a statistic, I was not a dot on a graph because, you know, he showed me all the data. You know, even after when you're diagnosed and even after you go through the treatment and a stem cell transplant, your average lifespan, average, I love that word, average, I love, hate that word, average lifespan will probably be about seven years, maybe 10 years if you're lucky. And I just looked at him. I said, thank you, doc. But I'm not a statistic. So I really do believe that by that time, uh, it was a cumulative effect of a lot of this self-investigation, self-celebration, meditation, all these practices that I'd integrated into my life in pursuit of understanding lasting happiness actually had created this bank of resilience in me, emotional resilience, that I wasn't aware of until I actually needed it. And that is an interesting kind of magic, and that's the only way I have of describing it. And then uh, during the treatment, Liza, you were put on steroids, your body bloated, your face rounded, and uh, your face became round. And then uh, you were very comfortable with your body when you even had to walk the red carpet for the Oscars. And I think that was a rebirth of you, and you realized that, oh my God, I've been shaming myself all these years, and I just feel so beautiful. There was an, ex an acceptance. So was it a, like a revelation, a, a rebirth, and then you finally accepted that this is who I am, and this is what I am? You've put it so beautifully, Renuka, actually. Um, it, it was exactly that. It was a rebirth and a revelation and a very, very profound acceptance. And I had to be bloated 40 pounds on steroids, you know, diagnosed with a very serious disease in order to do that. I guess I'm a late bloomer and a little stubborn. <laughs> Maybe I don't get the message. But it's, it's interesting because the reason I'm glad that you highlighted this, and I don't know if you experienced this, and I, I am speaking to the women in the room, is that there is so much self-doubt and perhaps a lot of society's attitudes that we internalize as women about this concept of beauty and how you're supposed to appear and how you're not supposed to appear. And all of this, you know, strange opinions of the world that we internalize as women to a point where we, no matter what you do, you feel you're doing something wrong. And then you take that and you put it on the red carpet, not this one, but you know, we're familiar with that whole, uh, what I call the dreaded red carpet walk, the red gang plank. Um, and then you're exposed to the scrutiny of the world. And it's interesting because I realized also when I was deciding whether I should go public or not, because as I said, I had, my appearance had changed dramatically. And I knew I was going to expose myself to criticism. So I decided that I'm going to use this opportunity to announce my diagnosis very, um, use this very public uh, moment to announce my diagnosis and take back the power for myself. But it's interesting because a woman's body, a morphing woman's body in the public eye seems to be public property. Everyone somehow is allowed to weigh in and judge it and critique it. And we've all sort of, I think, heard those stories about celebrities who have a baby, and then two months later, they're back into their original shape. And somehow, that's meant to be a great achievement. And I want to know why. Or illness, or when you're going through illness, you know, illness does take a toll. Or age, as well, for that matter. Our bodies morph, our bodies change, and somehow they're not allowed to. We are now going through an era in society and again, fed by this celebrity culture and fed by social media, where somehow a woman's body is not allowed to express itself. All the natural stages were meant to be told, you know, you should age gracefully, you should age this way, you should not look your age, you should, you know, so many should, should, should. So for me, that was an incredible revelation to stand there and say, this is who I am, 
I know that I'm changing physically, but it's because I'm battling a very serious disease and I'm proud of who I am and I'm here to tell you that you know I'm going to beat this and maybe with your help and your support, I'd like to ask for you to support me through this time. And it was the most unselfconscious I've ever been, you know, 40 pounds overweight. And I've actually never even gone back to that place. It's very, very interesting and I'm so glad that I had the support um, and maybe, you know, at that moment, the wherewithal and the guts to be able to stand in front of people and hijack that very public moment for something that was deeply personal and deeply important to me. I don't know, have you ever felt that, Renuka, like the pressure of society to either look a certain way? Can I tell you also how it's now being turned on its, on its head for me also? I find it rather fascinating because, of course, I've always wanted to write. I'm a Bengali, okay? We, we have it in the DNA, in the blood. We're very passionate about words. And I was determined that one day I would become a writer. And I've been a, a very voracious reader all along. I'm proud of my book because I own every single word in this book. And I know that I've literally cut open a vein in order to write, these, to write this story. And um, here's the interesting thing, though. Because now of my appearance and because of the labels on me, the most interesting reactions are those when somebody calls up my publisher and says, did she actually write this? Because it's really good. The assumption being that, of course, that somehow, because for a certain period of time, and I continue, of course, being in the public eye, and I continue occasionally being in front of the camera and taking on some acting assignments, etc., etc., the assumption is that you can't possibly be in that world and also be a legitimate writer. And again, this is turning the concept of, you know, the judgments that we place upon appearance and, you know, and masks and the labels on its head. So often I find these days, when I was actually launching my book, I went through one slight existential crisis when I was getting ready. And let me also say, I don't walk around like this. This took two hours to look this way. I'm a slob. I embrace that. I have really frizzy hair. I don't wear makeup. Like this is, this is my uniform. This is going to the office. This is putting on a suit and going to the office. And I embrace this part of myself. I own this part of myself because you know what? I do want to make myself presentable as well when I'm sitting and sharing with people. Um, why shouldn't I? But I have those doubts because I say, now I want to be taken seriously as a writer. I wanted to share a little piece of news with everyone which isn't public yet, but I've just signed on to write three more books. So I'm, thank you, thank you. It's honestly the most gratifying, like I get emotional when I think about it because this has been my lifelong aspiration and dream. Um, but I do have a little bit of self-doubt. For instance, when I was launching my book and I was getting ready, I said, oh, should I wear a khadi sari? <laughs> and maybe put a little oil in my hair and wear a bindi and all of that. And by the way, I embrace that. That is, there's nothing wrong with that. But I was having that self-doubt about how do I present myself now to have people take me seriously as a woman? Because we all know, re realistically speaking, no matter what, the patriarchy is alive and well all over the world. I'm not just pinpointing India where we make very, very quick judgments and assumptions about women. And especially women who voice their opinions very strongly. So I said, if in order to be taken seriously, do I have to now stop wearing makeup and stop presenting myself in a certain way? And then I was ready to do that. And I also often, I'm very casual and I'm very happy with presenting myself that way. But then I had another sort of revelation. I said, why? Why can I not be both? Why can I not marry these two worlds? What is wrong with doing that? Why do I have to fall into that trap of having to present myself a certain way in order to be taken seriously? Because I know who I am. I know that I have a certain talent as a writer. And I don't need the validation necessarily of saying, I need you to take me seriously, therefore I need to dress down. So it's interesting playing with these concepts as a woman. Do, do you ever experience any of that, Renuka? Uh, Lisa, uh, I, I want to bring out another paradox in this whole thing. I, I don't know, I somehow get a feeling maybe my professional doctor is taking over, 
but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just wondering whether emotionally the world has perceived you as a super glamorous uh, model and there is this huge attempt uh, for you to break this myth and say, hey, I'm just not a beautiful face, I've, I'm an intellect too. Is it also one of the reasons for you to want to write and to prove to the world that I'm not just... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's always there, of course, because I know myself. But that's not the reason why I wrote. I wrote because I really believe I'm a writer. Uh, although, you know, the content is, as I said, it's bringing together my public life, my private life, and my secret life, which we all have. And the thing is that people who know me well, that inner circle, they know that I'm, the, I'm not that. They know that I'm passionate about words. They know I'm passionate about art. In fact, I don't have any people, uh, any very close friends who are in the same industry as me. I've always, anyways, I've always naturally been aligned to writers or um, people in the arts, you know, visual artists and things like that. That's me. I don't occupy this world. I don't go for social engagements and things like that. And that's okay. You can do that. So I didn't write this book for that reason. I wrote it because I'm a writer. And I, I also, it puts out the, you know, the notion of, are you a writer only if you're published or if you write your whole life, you know? So there, there's a lot of interesting questions. It's not about taking, being taken seriously, it's about my work. It's not about me, it's about the words, uh, you know, and the message that I'm trying to send out. But I think that it's interesting to play with these concepts. We still do. And by the way, none of my friends will ever tell you I'm glamorous at all. I don't think of myself as glamorous. I have explained in this book that for, also, frankly, I don't think I'm beautiful. And I'm not saying that I'm not. I'm photogenic. There's a difference. And, um, and I'm very, very casual. I don't like makeup and I don't like fancy clothes when I'm not working when I'm not working. So there's all these challenges to perceptions. I think that it's interesting to play with that and to discuss that. Because, you know, I, I, you know, to bring it maybe back to emotional wellness is again, we always see people from the outside instead of, you know, we tend to, you know, judge with our eyes as opposed to listen. We all have to work on our listening and maybe, you know, we have to share our stories. I'm sharing my story. My story is no more important than anyone else's story but I do feel a compulsion to share it. And that is the one way that we get closer to, you, to each other. The other way is obviously emotional vulnerability. And that's been a very, very difficult lesson in my life. But ever since I have taken steps towards being vulnerable, towards being honest, towards being aligned with my values and my truth, I feel like nothing can stop me. Nobody has anything on me. And I'll t I'll show, I'll, here's an, another interesting thing that I wanted to point out. Maybe it's a dysfunction in society today, but you know, my book is a memoir, and I've had some people come up to me and say, how did you have the guts to be so honest? Very candid. Very candid. But I would say, how can you not be honest if you're writing a memoir? You know, I would almost turn it on its head. I would say, why is it that we're not honest? Why is that, you know, are we living in a society where we hide so much that vulnerability and honesty is something that we highlight in someone because it's not something that we come across every day? I feel that that's something interesting to think about because I know in my personal journey, emotional honesty, emotional nakedness, emotional vulnerability is the source of my strength today. You know, they say that, you know, for me, there is nothing, the truth is is the truth and nothing can wound me. It's only th when we keep things in the shadows, when we hide things, when we keep things secretive, that they have a power over us, when we bring them into the light. Those aspects of ourself, you know, whether they're things we are supposedly ashamed of or mistakes that we've made or flaws or failures, they can't have a power over you. They can only make you better. And I have a wonderful, um, analogy for that or a wonderful sort of metaphor for that that I've written about, which is the Japanese art of lining broken ceramic with gold. I don't know if anyone's come across it. It's called kintukusuroi. And imagine just this transcendent way of taking a piece of pottery that is broken, and when you line that crack, that wound with gold, you actually make the object more beautiful for having been broken. And there is a place, an important place in our society, in our dialogue today, to say there is a place for better than new, 
for experience, for celebrating our wounds and our humanness with each other and exposing them to each other. And not just that, but lining them with gold because they are what make us. Absolutely. Um, are you ready for some rapid fire, Lisa? We've yeah. been speaking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for it. Go for it? Okay. I was getting very, very emotionally, you know, uh, listening to your story. I said, no, I think I have to lighten the mood. This was going really deep, but it was so thoughtful and it was very uh, thought provocating because, uh, you know, hearing you and seeing you as a person um, and the pain that you've gone through, you know, uh, just wanting to put it in the book and maybe wanting to inspire, wanting to uh, reach out and tell people that, you know, you don't have to be scared. You can go through anything. I've gone through it and I've overcome. But then that's, that's, that's I think, very brave. And I think that's very inspiring. So I'm sure that your other books are also going to, you know, inspire. I'm Thank so you. happy Thank about you. This. But let's not also forget that one of my coping mechanisms is also humor, but a really, really bad form of humor. Like, I'm just a complete nerd. I tell really bad jokes, so I won't subject anyone here to that. But, you know, it makes me happy. It makes me smile. And that's what matters at the end of the day. That's also what got me through a lot of my cancer. Okay, now there's the time check. Okay, Lisa, okay. I'm not going to let you talk more than a line. I know. Basically, you're saying I've been talking too much. Too much. Sorry. So it's just you should have just cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Three words. What's your favorite thing in your closet right now? What is what? Your favorite thing in your closet right now. In my closet? Mm. Well, I'm 47, so Spanx. <laughs> um, in my closet. Um, actually, only one, only one, one. Oh, yeah. I thought you said three things. No. I heard three. What's your favorite? Oh, I heard multiples. Okay, sorry. Okay. So Spanx. What's your favorite? Okay, wait, no. Describe yourself as a teenager, three words. What's that? Describe yourself as a teenager in three words. <laughs> teenager. Um, sulky, um, sensitive, and contradictions. Really? And hormonal, for sure. Very hormonal. Oh my God, now I'm a mother, so I think about it with dread. You know how you always say, oh, Bapre, my God, if my children do half of what I did, <laughs> I'm in trouble. That's going to be my last question. Okay, if you could have any three people, past, present, dead, alive, over for dinner, who would they be? Oh, wow. I would, okay, present would be Pico Iyer. He's one of my favorite writers, travel writer. I think he's just, he'd be wonderful. Um, past, past. Let me see, past. Time's up. No, you're supposed to go tick, 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 tick. 41, 40, 39. But I can say anything now. Past, present. I need to say past. Anybody. Why are you being so difficult, Renuka? Really? Don't you know I was up at 5 o'clock this morning and I'm old and I'm wearing Spanx? And it's cutting off the blood to my brain, I think. Oh my God. <laughs> That's the reality. Too much information, I know. Past, there's actually too many people from the past. I have so many inspirations. Um, oh, Jahanara. Definitely, Jahanara from the past. Pico Iyer. Yeah, Jahanara. You know, incredible woman, incredible. We don't talk about her enough. We talk about Shah Jahan, but not Jahanara. And uh, should I say future? <laughs> I'd love to see my kids. I put them together, souffle. I want to see what they become. They will, they will. You will see them. What job would you be absolutely horrible at? What, sorry? What job would you be horrible at? Job. Absolutely horrible at? Anything to do with spreadsheets and presentations and numbers. Yeah, anything to do with that. I actually use that as my personal calling card. I say, look at me. My definition of success is I've gotten this far without ever looking at a spreadsheet. How did That's you know my, my personal best? definition. How did you know my next question? What is the biggest thing you've gotten away with? That was my next question. <laughs> the biggest thing I've gotten away with is, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how I'm sitting here on this stage. It's all of, you know, pe with people's grace. I don't know how it is that people are sitting here and... 
and listening to me. So I somehow I've gotten away with this, <laughs> obviously. Okay, what would you do if you were the opposite sex for a month? As <gasps> <laughs> Oh my God, that is, that's just naughty, isn't it? It's just naughty. You know what I would do is I would, I would, you know, I'd make sure that I was in a position of power and I would rewrite the constitution so that all, so that our next PM has to be a woman. <laughs> that's it, man. Or assassinate someone. I'm not going to say who. I want to get into trouble. I'm not, no one here in this country. No one here in this country. Uh, you know. We shall talk about that later. What is the stupidest thing you have ever done? The stupidest, stupidest thing? Stupidest thing. I've written about all the stupid things that I've done in this book. There's many of them. Um, I don't have any regrets, though, let me say that. I think the stupidest thing that I have done is allow the world to tell me who I am when I was young. That's the stupidest thing that I've done. I thought you were going to say you... Hand in sand over Shekhar Kapoor. Oh yes, I did fling a big handful of sand in Shekhar Kapoor's face in Juhu Beach, but that, hey, we're still friends, so that's okay. Okay, so uh, my second last question, what's the last thing you Google today? What's the, sorry? Last thing you Google today. What's the last thing I Googled? Emotions. So I said, I'm, I'm speaking on emotional wellness. I wanted to see what the definition of emotions are. <laughs> Would you like to know? Because uh, I wrote it down. Okay. Great emotions. Speaking. Well, I mean, we are. Let's, let's pinpoint what it is. We think we know what it is. But I thought it was quite interesting. Because I do speak on this quite a lot. Emotions are states of feeling that result in physical and psychological changes that influence behaviors. There you go, straight from Google, thank you. But what I, what I thought about that that's interesting is that the emotions influence not just our psychological but physical, and not just behaviors but us physically. And that is why I think emotional wellness is so essential because our body also takes a cue from our emotions. Remember that. I don't think that it's such a straightforward thing that you can separate out physical illness from emotional illness either. Yes, absolutely. And my last, last question, I've been actually saving this question. And I'm going to look at your face when I ask you. You have always rebelled against a convention, against your mom, against everything. Now you have 14-month-old twins. How would you handle it if they followed their mama's footsteps, karma hitting back big time? It's so bad. I really do think about this already. And they're already very strong personalities. And of course, I want to nurture out there and do everything, but as long as mama is chaperoning. It's okay. You can go to Europe, but mama will be right behind carrying your bag. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it is, it is karma. I hope you never know until you become a mother, actually. You know, so I understand my mother so much better today. So that's a wonderful side benefit. But in all seriousness, I do hope that my kids are strong, independent, and uh, hopefully, you know, influencers for good in this world. That's the best that we can do for our girls and our children today is teach them, teach them well. Thank you, Liza. I think she deserve, deserves a huge round of applause. It's truly been such a lovely evening with you, Liza. And the time's just... We are over, I mean, we've gone up by a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, I told you I'm not good with numbers. So you never, never put numbers in front of me. I won't stick to it. I guarantee it. I'll have to defy it. Because that's a defiant part of me. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Renika. This was amazing. And you're just amazing. And you made it so warm and lovely. Were we going to ask uh, for like a few questions? Or if there's anyone curious about anything? Or you want to get me off the stage? I'm okay either way. Um, no, Liza, we'll have to get you off stage because uh, we, we, uh, my, my audience have been sitting from then, but then I'm not rude. Uh, I've got the audience to, uh, I mean, they're going to write questions for you. Okay. And yeah, uh, we have a very important panel coming after this. And uh, so... Um, Basically, I'll get off the stage. And you guys all get up and stretch now. We should do like a group stretch. Done. <laughs>
<laughs> Honestly, if anyone wants to ask Lisa questions, just scribble it out and she will answer uh, your questions. I mean, your answers will be sent But to very you. seriously, I just wanted to thank everyone for your kind attention. You've been really wonderful and I do understand you've, you know, that you've, you've been sitting here for a long time. So I'm very, very uh, humbled that you dine to sit even longer. So thank you so much. And please go have coffee, tea, stretch, chat. Stretch. Stretching is very important. Thank you.